Okay, sorry, that was a little awkward. <laughs> Um, good dance, evening. You yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the living room. Thank you all for being here tonight, everyone in the room and everyone signing in and, um, from around the globe online. We're super happy to have you. Um, tonight we're doing a patient roundtable, and we've got some new faces in the room. Um, we've got some new people that I know are signing in online. So what I thought we'd do, um, as opposed to what we do normally when we, when we have a speaker presentation, um, you, know, you, know, you know, I ask everybody to keep their introductions fairly short. I think this is a really great opportunity, um, particularly for some of the new folks um, to the living room, to learn who it is, um, you know, that they're sitting next to or around the room, hear their journey, uh, you know, find maybe some commonalities and maybe help spark questions and, and, um, and, and answers uh, throughout the evening. So that goes for everybody live um, here in the room and everyone on online. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Danielle Hicks. Um, my, I'm not a title person. I, I like helper is like my, my most favorite title, but um, I'm the associate executive director um, in charge of patient services and programs. So anything and everything that has to do with patient touch is my area of responsibility here at the foundation. And um, equally as important to that, I'm one of Bonnie's daughters. Uh, my sister who's in the room tonight uh, will make sure that she tells you she's the youngest daughter, so, she's the oldest. so I'm going to go ahead and just say the oldest one right right off the bat. Um, and uh, the way we're going to do this tonight, for those of you who may not um, be familiar with how a, a, a round table living room works, is we're, like I said, going to start with introductions. And tonight, um, I think it's important that maybe you share your story, and of course I'll butt in where you get it wrong, but I think we should, we should maybe start, start there. Okay. Well, you know, we're just, we're just back from ASCO. And That's ASCO, not your story. Well, well I'm going to tell my story in a minute. Okay. You're not in charge of me. You're the helper. <laughs> I'm not the boss. You're the helper. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm not going to belabor ASCO because we have somebody coming next month that's a physician who was at ASCO, and he's going to talk about all of the new therapies and everything new that came out at ASCO. But... I was asked to speak at a, a speak on a panel with Roche, thank you Roche, uh, which is one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world, and they 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 asked me to tell my story in ten minutes. <clears throat> so I thought, how how do you tell your story and everything about this foundation, which is thirteen years old now, in ten minutes? How do you wrap up thirteen years into ten minutes? And I did it. I did it. And it turned out really, really well. But, um, you know, I, I was um, diagnosed 13 years ago. I'm a 13-year lung cancer survivor. Just so you know, it can happen. And, and, you know, I think one of the things that the patients that come, you know, in here and dial in and whatever, they love, you know, hearing everyone's story going around the room because it gives them so much hope that there are people that, are surviving after five years and, and eight years and 10 years and now 13 years here. Um, but I was a classic story, misdiagnosed forever and didn't, didn't take no for an answer, didn't say there's nothing I can do, didn't take there's nothing I can do for you for an answer. And I um, finally found somebody that I, I asked, he, he asked me, he said, his name is David Jablons. He's, a, um, he's a, a thoracic surgeon up at UCSF, and he's also in charge of research up there. And he said, Bonnie, what, what are your expectations? What do you want from me? And I said, I want you to hit it out of the park for me. I want you to give me all you've got. I don't care how painful it is. I don't care if I have to throw up every day. I don't care. And if I don't live, I don't live. But I don't want to die because I didn't get everything you've got. So throw it at me. So he said, okay, okay. He said, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. And my point telling you that story is that you need to have a conversation with your physician the same way. You need to tell them exactly what your expectations are and put them on the spot. And they'll, then they'll let you know if they can you know, live up to your expectations. So um, I did that. I had chemotherapy, radiation, all of those things. and. And then, and a, like a 12-hour surgery afterward, the tumor I had was on my heart. And um, they, I, I'm here. 
I'm here after 13 years. I wouldn't be here if I didn't have that conversation with, with my, my physician, the one that I finally found that I thought, you know, had the capability to, to, really, to really give it a go. So um, when I was going through, especially chemotherapy, and I was in that Barker lounger, I, I, I did spend a lot of time on the internet and seeing all these things, and all of a sudden I was reading all these statistics about other cancers and lung cancer. And I heard lung cancer is the biggest. More people have lung cancer, men and women, than any other cancer in the world. And more lung cancer than breast, colon, and prostate cancer combined. And I'm thinking, well, why is their survival rate so low for lung cancer and so high for those other three cancers? And to me, that was just a huge injustice. So I made a promise to myself in the Barco lounger when I was having chemotherapy that if I was lucky enough to get out of the park with, my, with my, my team, I would do something to change that. So that was um, 13 years ago, and here we are today, and we are changing it. And I'm only going to give you a couple little snippets from ASCO. 10 years ago, when, I, when we went to our first ASCO, they weren't talking about lung cancer at all. all they, they were talking about breast, colon, and prostate. And this year, they were talking about about lung cancer everywhere, in the hallways, in, in the conference rooms, in the sidebars. Lung cancer has become the leading cancer. Um, it has more, uh, more um, targeted markers. It's got more genomics involved. It's leading the way <coughs> to the eventuality of, of curing cancer. So lung cancer is on everyone's minds now, and it's, it's, a, it's a race to the finish. So nothing but good news. And come next month, and you'll have a physician here talking about each and every one of the issues that were, that were um, discussed at ASCO this year, which are all very exciting. But think survival. Think survival. And push your physician. Don't take no for an answer. And if you get a no, <coughs> we'll help you find somebody that has a better answer. OK, that's it. So, so from, you know, I know we have a lot of caregivers and support people in the room and, and watching online. So from the perspective of someone who was on your, you know, support team, um, and I'll ask Andrea to maybe chime in at some point um, about this as well, the, the, what you're talking about and with, you know, the sadly unique situation with your physician saying, what do you want, right? Like actually asking you what your expectations were, what you wanted to get out of this, what your goals were, and creating that sort of shared decision-making process is huge, right? Um, and I think um, it, it, it is so important in the way that it impacts the care that you receive, um, having that conversation and letting your doctor know what your expectations are. So I just wanted to kind of point that out as, as yeah. number one. And one of the things that was great was that they weren't just, you know, we were all in the room. So it was my, you know, my sister, my, my brother and I, uh, my, my stepdad, Tony, my mom, <coughs> all of us being allowed to be part of that conversation had such, I think, impact and positivity on what we were going through. And there were no, there was no question about the road we were getting ready to, to kind of try to help hold your hand while you were walking through, there was no, you know, walk in the park. But we knew what, we knew what that was going to look like up front, and it made all the difference in the world. So I just kind of wanted to... Um, and it's a two-way discussion. You ask your physician, what are your expectations? What's your plan? What do you want for me? What can you do for me? It's, it's a good conversation to have. It really is. Everybody's on notice now. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Drive. You have to drive mm -hmm. your own survival. And it's so challenging, the dynamic, being a family member of someone who you, who's like, you know, the matriarch, like the center of your family, all of a sudden become like this person who actually, instead of just providing help for everyone, is needing help but not asking for it. God knows. That would be terrible to ask for help. Um, <laughs> Um, and and f the helpless feeling that that was is you know being being a kid and I know that um, Tony the same thing and friends and family members it's it's a challenge and it's a struggle so in spite of the fact that that's a difficult conversation for a lot of people to have whether the physicians in the room or not I encourage you to have it because it's so important for everyone involved and 
And, you know, maybe that's where we can start this tonight after we go around the room and, and hear a little bit about everybody's story. Then maybe we can start the conversation about, A, coping with the diagnosis, because that's one thing that, you know, I mean, it's like getting hit by an 18-wheeler and, you know, how, how you cope through that. And then you do have a plan and how you, how you get through that as well with your, your children and your families and, and what have you. Does that, does that sound like a good thing to do tonight? If we can get there, it's on the list. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Andre, I don't know if you have anything you want to add from back behind the speaker. So Andre is the younger sister, as we already pointed out earlier, and she helps facilitate the online folks. So the folks that are dialing in from around the globe get to ask questions online and chat. Um, so that's Andrea. Hi. So um, yes, I'm the online behind the scenes. I'm not sitting up front today. I have to go pick up my daughter. Um, sneak out for a few minutes but um, I think being um, you know I, I'd like to go on to what my mom and my sister said because I think in, in 2014 it was almost an archaic time to be diagnosed with lung cancer 2004 um, 2004 what, what did I say 14 14, 14. Yeah. I'm, I'm behind a couple years <laughs> um, in 2004 it was such an archaic time to be diagnosed and 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 our mom was fortunate to have an outside the box physician surgeon pulmonologist team and was kind of taught early on. And so there's, so we look at now, there's no excuses to not have that team. Um, and especially with all the amazing things that are happening, our mom referenced ASCO. And um, every year we kind of dread going to ASCO, but we always come back so, um, so excited and so pumped up because there's, the talk is lung cancer now. Um, but there, your voice matters, your voice needs to, li to be heard and not just your voice, your loved ones. Um, and it's just super important. And we do attribute it um, to the reason why our mom is here today, because she was told no. There's nothing. It, it did take more than one visit with other physicians before I landed on somebody that said they would try to kick it out of the and that, That's an important point, because we literally had to put together our own team. Our physicians weren't all from the same place, right? Back in, the, the, you know, however long ago, we said it was 13 years ago, finding a comprehensive lung cancer team, I mean, it just, they, were, they weren't around. There were comprehensive breast teams, you know, and, and, and colon and, and prostate, and, and prostate. that's why they were doing really, so well. It was really hard to have to put together the team, and I yeah. think that's one of the things you said back then about, you know, coming out the knot hole, if you will, um, making it so other people didn't, it shouldn't be that hard to get good quality care. And I just want to point out um, something Andrea said about dreading ASCO, because that's not necessarily because of the wonderful information coming out of it, it's because it literally is like speed dating for five days from 8 a.m. till 11 p.m. in meeting after meeting and session after session. There's so much great stuff going on. It's, it's Well, there's 20,000 people there. Yeah. You know, and they're, they're everywhere. The convention center is huge, and it's attached to huge hotels. And you have a meeting at 9 o'clock with this person in the Grand Hyatt, and then your next meeting is in the convention center on the fourth floor south. And, you know, you're walking around with these maps. And yeah, the meetings are all over. One, yeah, it's crazy. It's one, crazy. Before you go on to the next deal, you know, one takeaway that I had from ASCO is at every single one of our meetings, there, um, whether it was our industry partners or um, just general partners, they asked, how can we get the information to the patients? Mm -hmm. It's their key. It's they want to get you guys the information, whether it's, you know, information about a new product, information <coughs> about resources, you know, whether it's help with copays or um, anything. And they want to know how they can get you guys that information. And, and they are smart and they do come to advocacy yeah. um, groups like us. Yeah. So, and next month we have... Um, we have Jonathan Rees from University of uh, uh, UC Davis coming to talk about Best of ASCO, but we're going to have um, other pharmaceutical representatives here as well, and some other some other people that you know are in in you know like blood bi blood biopsy work and various different things. So there'll be there'll be uh, quite a crowd with lot lot to ask questions and a lot of solutions. Um, so I'm going to look at Katie, sorry, um, if you just introduce yourself and talk about, you, you have a nice sort of caregiver perspective as well. Yeah. So my name's Katie Wilcox, I'm on the events team here at the foundation. Um, I actually moved over from the corporate world after 
so I had volunteered for a long time, but my mom had passed away from um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So when that happened, I said, I need to take what I'm doing from a volunteer standpoint and turn it into a career. Um, so before this, I was with the American Cancer Society. And then I moved over to this foundation because I was so inspired by the work they were doing. And it's, we're really such a small team, but I feel the impact we make is such a big impact. Um, and we're able to touch patients internationally through the living room like this. Um, and it's, it's a pretty powerful foundation to work for. So um, it's wonderful to see everybody here participating in these types of conversations. Um, and our team is here to support you guys in whatever, whatever you need. So awesome. Thanks, Katie. My name is Dave, and I was diagnosed with um, lung cancer back in March of this year, so I'm relatively new. And they quickly uh, figured out my um, particular type of tumor and the drug that I would take, so I've been on Tarceva now for almost three months. And good news, I had my scan last week and met with my oncologist, and my tumors have shrunk uh, in half, so in three months, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that'll, that'll kind of make you short-winded pretty quick. <laughs> anyway, um, so the things that I would like uh, to, to talk about would be if there's other Tarsiva patients, I know we've got at least a, a few in the room tonight, I would certainly like to pick your brain as to things I can expect long-term because it looks like I'll be on this for a while. So um, anyway, that's, uh, that's my story, <laughs> and I'm sticking to it. Thanks, Dave. Um, hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Carol Dorshkin, and I was diagnosed in uh, 2011 with non-small cell adenocarcinoma and had surgery and removing one of the lobes, and then that was followed by chemo in case there were any microscopic cells <clears throat> floating around my body. And... Uh, I was lucky to have a very supportive team too, both medically and my family. And uh, you brought up you know, how it is to get that diagnosis. Um, and it was, of course, I'm sure as everybody knows, it's a huge shock and you don't really know how to process it. And you know, I had a, a task right away, what do I do right away? And, Eventually, you know, within two weeks, I had the surgery, and I had confirmation from a second. Uh, I was able to find a second opinion and know that that was the route I needed to go. And anyway, now I've, uh, I thought I was home free after that chemo and the removal of the major tumor, but um, then it came back and metastasized in, in my lungs only, and luckily there's no, been no lymph node involvement. And I've been on um, maintenance, chemo, different series of two drugs each time uh, ever since. And I get it every two weeks, my chemo. Except if I'm traveling or doing something fun, then I postpone it. So um, that, and I just had my chemo today. It affects, uh, I mean, if anybody's interested I can go over the drugs. Well, I'll just mention it's Abraxane and uh, Vastin at this point, but I have had other drugs. <coughs> and it seems to be easy for me to tolerate. I do get tired. I kind of lose my appetite for a week, but then the second week I can eat anything I want, so it, that's all right. It works okay for me. So um, I don't know... I'm happy to answer questions. I want to provide hope for people newly diagnosed, that it's been over six years since I was diagnosed, and um, I'm still feeling good and having good scans. And the doctors say, you know, we just keep hoping for new developments at the conferences or with the, and eventually, you know, if this drugs, if these drugs stop working, I'll go on to something else. And my doctor seems to feel he has a lot of tricks up his sleeve, and, and that's, so anyway, things are going well for me, thank goodness. You know, one, one note of encouragement <clears throat> is that uh, more drugs have been approved in the last 18 months than, they've, than there have been in the last four decades for lung cancer. I, I, that story, we wouldn't have heard that 10 years ago. 
No, people have been saying things are happening, things, lots of things are happening. You know, if you can just hang in there and, you know, then maybe we'll find something that can address your, my cancer. It's KRAS mutation and that there are no targeted drugs like yours. But um, hopefully soon. And, and then I wanted to, to just touch quickly on something serious. When I was diagnosed, um, you know, I assumed I wasn't gonna live very long. This one doctor did tell me that only 1% of the patients live five years, which I didn't ask him either. So I wasn't happy to have him tell me that. But, um, but I managed to find a silver lining and my family had uh, serious conversations about that. You know, we addressed some serious issues, a few tears, lots of hugs. That was all positive. And then I found something I could be happy about. I wasn't going to turn into a decrepit old person who depended on my children and a burden on my children. So that's how I coped with the idea that I wasn't going to live that long. But now I'm not sure. We'll have to see. <laughs> and I think it's important. But keep going where you're going. That's good. Yeah, that's I think awesome. it's important too because, you're, Carol, you're not the first person who said that their physician has offered up some information that may or may not be relevant to you, you and your cancer or how you're gonna react, right? And we talk about it all the time. Everyone's cancer is different. Your cancer is your own. So although you, there's benefit in talking to one another, um, you know, about managing side effects or how you're reacting, like you're saying, Dave, like what to expect on Tarceva down the road, that sort of thing, it's really helpful in groups like this. No two people are, are necessarily gonna react the same to any drug. So um, it's important that we don't, no, but nobody gets to decide when someone or its time is or isn't up. And it's, it frustrates me beyond belief when we hear over and over and over again, well, you know, statistics will say, and first of all, when you get online and you look at statistics, whether they're coming from SEER or ACF, ACS or whatever, yeah. they're typically several years in the rear. So they haven't even caught up with what's been going on in the last five years, let alone the last, you know, three weeks, two new drugs were approved. That's not identified anywhere in the in the in the yeah. data that you're that you're finding online. So, it's challenging. One of, one of the docs we work with, his name is David Gandara from UCSF, uh, UC Davis up in um, Sacramento, and he's done several living rooms, amazing oncologist, but he's also an amazing researcher, and you know he's part of everything involved out there in the world in in lung cancer. And one of the one of the living rooms he was in, uh, and I know I keep telling this story for for nice. some of the folks that, you know, have seen David, but it's so hopeful for new patients. He, I remember one time he was in here and he said, "How how many kinds of how many different kinds of lung cancer do you think there are?" So I'm going to ask you, how many different Just kinds of lung people. cancer do you think there are? You raise a hand. Everybody else has heard it. You got anything? Everybody, raise your hand if you've already know the answer. If you have a guess. There you go. Okay. Okay. So, so he said, there are as many lung cancers as there are people that have it. Because every single person is different. And, and we know, and his analogy is that we know that our fingerprint is unique to us and no one else has the exact same fingerprint. Well, nobody has the exact same body print as you do either. Nobody has the same genomic profile that you have. So all of these various therapies work differently on people. Some, you know, last a long time, some not so much. Some of the immunotherapies, you know, last a really long time, some not so much. It's, 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 we're, we're getting to the age of chronically managing, you know, lung cancer. So it's, you know, we can, it's step by step. So one of, it, it, and that's, it, great point, Mom, thank you, um, and I think, one of the things I want to point out, and Carol, you said something that kind of sparked the, the comment in my mind, you know, when we're looking, and then, of course, if everyone's cancer is unique to them, it, all of this points back to why it's so important that you're working with somebody who's an expert in your disease. I, I cannot stress it enough. Um, when you look at the number of cancers, when you go from solid tumors cross over into blood cancers, there's a little over 100, right? So if you walk into, particularly in the rural areas, it's a, it's a big challenge. You walk into a general oncologist's office and he's expected to treat whatever walks in the door. 
And in my opinion, it's not fair to expect this one human being to know everything there is to know about all 100 cancers. He's not a computer. <laughs> How does he know? How does he know if he hasn't looked at the guidelines in two months that there were two new drugs approved for lung cancer last week? Yeah. Right, when lung cancer is not all he's treating. So I cannot stress enough, and we can help um, uh, for anybody online or anybody who comes back and watches this after, um, we can help facilitate those second opinions around the world with folks who, who specialize in lung cancer. So I just want to spit that and, out really and quick. And who are most <clears throat> of the physicians that Danielle's talking about in rural areas or even you know around the corner mm -hmm. are more than willing to listen to the expert. Mm -hmm that you bring to the table. You go and get the second opinion, and then you put the docs together, and they start talking to each other. And, you know, the, the oncologist you have in that particular area is listening, and, you know, they're working together as a team. Yeah, and I've, I've had patients say, well, why do I have to come to you for that information and then bring it back to my doctor? Isn't this what he or she went to school with? But again, I point back to, I don't, I don't feel like it's fair. Long gone are the days when a, you know, a physician's desk reference came out every year and you could just kind of look up whatever the ailment was and the answer was right there because nothing was really changing that fast. Things are changing so quickly that it's ever so important. It's never been more important, I don't think, well, than it and, is now. And to Daniel's point, there's, there's a Bible that the oncologists go by and it's called the NCCN guidelines. <clears throat> well, it's not updated you know, every couple of months. It takes a while for the new information that was delivered at ASCO to get into that guidebook. So are they giving you good information as good as they've got? But you want today's information. You want what's going on right now. And that's, that's, that's out there for you and we can help you. We can help you make sure you get that. We'll continue to beat that dead horse at probably every lung cancer living room there is. Right. So, um, over, and and over, over and over and over and over. Fred, sorry, your turn. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, my name is Fred Palmer, and I was diagnosed with non cell uh, lung cancer in October of 2013. I'm currently on immunotherapy, and uh, when I was first diagnosed, immunotherapy didn't exist. Yep. But wait a second. Where are you going Sunday? You're leaving Sunday. What are you going to do? Give the mic. I'm going on a three-week uh, tour that involves my family. Driving? Well, yes. All over the United States. Well, from Chicago to uh, uh, the East Coast. Yeah, he's, he's driving a lot. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fun. But that's exciting. That's exciting that you can have, you know, late stage cancer, anything, and be planning like that. And, and, and you should be. You should be. I can't stress that enough. Don't put your life on hold for cancer because then cancer's winning. Don't let it win. Hi, my name's Rick. I was diagnosed with stage four non-small cell adenocarcinoma back in February of 2015. Um, went through a year of chemo at uh, Kaiser Santa Clara. Um, in between there, I had, um, when one of the drugs was not, um, my tumor didn't respond to it, they removed my um, adrenal gland and four months of chemo after that, and my scans have been clear, and I've been 16 months cancer-free. So life is good. And like uh, Carol was saying, it, it, it gave me an action plan to wrap up all those loose ends to get yeah. the trust done and... Yeah. You know the will, and which we should all do anyway, and all and get the polls posted on the door and yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. But it's been good. It it took me um, though, being at Kaiser, um, I don't know if it happens elsewhere. It took me four months to find um, the Adario Foundation, and so I was, you know searching high and low, trying to get information about, about the disease. And just looking on the internet, you go to so many different weird places and weird remedies. But um, I was just curious, do you guys get a chance to put in front of 
organizations like Kaiser, Palo Alto Med. Oh my God, you know, this makes me crazy, okay? This makes me absolutely crazy. There we go. There was an oncologist <laughs> in Kaiser who had lung cancer. They come to our 5K run in September every year. There's like 100 people from yeah. Kaiser permanently there. You know, it's not that we're not so, doing the talking. But what, but <laughs> we're not talking and, and, to and each other. And it's not just Kaiser. I mean, yeah. it happens all the time. So we do, we do, we do have conversations. To answer your question, we sit down yeah. in front of these guys all the time, provide them with all of our materials, our support services, so on and so forth. There's varying reasons why that information doesn't always get passed down to the patients, and we've identified those as gaps that we're currently trying to figure out how to fill. So. Any and all information or advice or suggestions you guys might have on how to better have these conversations and ensure, you know, that the, the important, this important information is getting down yeah. to, to you. We're and, all ears. And you all can help, and the people online can help. You know, when you're talking to people, you know, tell them that we're a resource, you know, for them. And you know, give them our information. I, I, I don't remember what, how many, how many patients are diagnosed every, every three minutes of lung cancer. It's ridiculous amounts of people. That's a lot. I don't remember by the minute. Um, it's 225,000 a year in the U.S. Who's paying it? Who's paying it? Seven. Sam, do you know? I don't Everybody remember. Knows. Everybody should know. I knew that. 19 an hour. I know it's 19 an hour. I, I can't remember. If you do the math, well, 19 what an is hour 19 is. divided by 60, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's the biggest cancer in, in, in the world. You know, it's, it's for men and women. Um, so everybody, if you, if you just chatted at a table, a lunch table, where you didn't know anybody and you started talking, somebody at the table would say, oh, my mother, my father, my grandfather, they would say somebody has lung cancer. I know. Hey, for, my, for my point, I, uh, I end up, whenever I come to the living rooms, I always take a couple of the 360 degrees of hope, the awesome. book, and yeah. I get the USB flash drives. Yeah, that's great. Perfect. And I give them yeah. to new patients in the other support groups that I'm at at Kaiser and Stanford. Yeah. So, yeah. It's fantastic. You know, it's, Anybody yeah. who wants to take handbooks or USB drives with them Throw tonight, in the trunk. please feel you know, free. Yeah. Come right. to go yeah. see Sam. Yeah. She will hand you whatever yeah. materials you need. Yeah. Katie, that's exactly what I was going to say. I was going to say locally, we've really tapped into hospitals and physicians in this area, but we could always do more. But people who are tuning in from other parts of the world, if you reach out to us, we are more than happy to mail you material or get you material, and then you could take that to your hospitals, pass it along to patients, and we've had patients do that for us. And that, again, we're a small team. So to be able to have that support in places like Chicago or South Carolina, Spartanburg, where we do an event, is a huge, huge help of on, on the ground support. So we are definitely open to that. That's a, that's a great point, Katie. Anybody who wants to be a, an ambassador on the ground, wherever you are in the world, we're happy to send you the information. And, and, and locally, it's sort of proof positive, you know, that, that it does work because we get new patients coming in from here. Yeah all the time and it's 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 crazy i actually got someone from prague a second opinion one time that's dialed in from another country and you think huh how how is it that 140 people in 143 countries know about us and you who live in the community doesn't i don't know i don't you know i'm not quite sure how to resolve that but we we work on it on a daily basis to make that happen yeah thanks Rick. miss sally talk about archaic and I'm going back to 1975 when my mother was diagnosed and she was just told we're going to have surgery we're going to remove it afterwards you're going to be fine no talking of staging or anything like that and I asked about a bi the biopsy and was told to go home and stick to cooking my chicken soup and then two and a half years later my mother got it in the other lung and I asked the prognosis and was told, you know, it's not good. She lives 18 more years. So there's hope for everybody, but they sure do things differently today. And thank God for that. Um, I was at high risk because my mother, her brother, and my paternal grandfather had lung cancer. And I also had been a smoker, but I had quit many years before. And I found out there was a study looking to see if they could find 
lung cancer earlier with a low dose CAT scan than with the uh, x-rays. Because they used to say back in my mother's day, by the time they saw it on an x-ray, it was too late. But she was lucky. Anyway, so I read and heard about the International Early Lung Cancer Assessment Program. And I got in touch with, they were doing it at that time out of um, Peninsula Hospital, the Cancer Center. And I called them and I got in on that. And what they were doing was once, well, you had to meet the requirements. And I did. You had to be what they called a 30-pack year smoker, which meant you had 30 packs within that amount of time, um, a year rather. You could smoke five a day, or you know, five packs a day, or one pack a day, whatever. Anyway, I just qualified because I almost missed out because I had quit so many years before. So that was 2004, and they told me I had nodules, and of course I panicked. And that they said they didn't feel they were cancerous and that they would keep checking them. And they do, and then I went running to my own doctor because I didn't believe what they were telling me. And uh, I was reassured that they would be watching these. They were small nodules. And they did. Every year I was part of this study and I got another low dose CAT scan. And in 2009, I went expecting to be told same thing, that nothing changed, and got a shock when they called me the next day to tell me that they felt I had lung cancer, that one of them had grown. But it was found very early, so I was very fortunate. I had surgery. Nothing had spread anywhere else. I still have other nodules, one that's grown a little bit, but not enough to do anything about yet. I'm watched very closely by my oncologist, and I can't just say enough about if you think you're at high risk for lung cancer, to make sure you get a CAT scan, low-dose CAT scan. Thanks, Sally. And even if you don't qualify for the screening program, which drives me crazy that it's only for smokers, it's still, again, the only, the only cancer that is um, alienated. Um, Talk to your pulmonologist or your primary physician, and if you've got it in your family or you've got a cough that you've had for a while and whatever, just demand yeah. a CAT scan. And the, the, just demand it. Yeah, Tell the guidelines as they come through, just for anybody who might be interested because of a friend or family member that they might want to share the information with, um, um, the guidelines as they sit right now through the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial is 55 and over with a 30-pack um, year history. So either a pack a day for 30 years or two packs a day for 15 years and not quit within X amount of time, similar to 15, similar to IL-CAP. Um, the guidelines for IL-CAP are a little less stringent. So, you know, for example, you only have to be 40, you don't have to be 55, and, and there are IL-CAP sites still open. So if anybody wants more information on that, we're, we're happy to, to provide it. And for a lot of, and through IL-CAP, I think it's, a hundred cigarettes in a lifetime for, and I joke, but it's like like one bad weekend in college, right? Right. It's like, exactly. You never, exactly. you you yeah. know, for a lot of people, you just yeah. don't know. Yeah. So, yeah. thank you, Sally. Tina, um, my name's Tina, and I was diagnosed in 2010. So I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, I did chemo and radiation, and then I was also tested positive for the EGFR. Mutation. So um, after the chemo and radiation, I went on Tarceva, I guess more or less insurance, and I've been on it ever since, and that's been six years on the Tarceva. Uh, last week, I had a clean scan again and, a, and also a clean brain scan. I had an MRI, too, so nice. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty excited about that. Nice. Um, my doctor said last week, he said, you know, you've been on this Tarsiva for a very long time. We're kind of at a crossroads here. And I thought he might be saying, do you want to stop taking it? And, but I wasn't sure. I mean, I don't think really well when I go see my doctor after a scan. I'm just like, <laughs> you know, anxious about everything. But um, he said, how would you like to do, be part of uh, a study for liquid biopsy? 
and it is a blood test. And he said, would you be willing to give a few tubes of blood? And I said, sure. I'll do it. And, oh, um, my goodness. Sorry. So sorry. Okay. So sorry. I got it. Boop. Oh, no. Oh, no. You didn't. Sorry. Hold on. I got it now. So what I understand. <laughs> wow. It's Lisa what Molina, I understand, by the way. probably isn't exactly right. <gasps> Come take the phone. I don't know what's happening. Sorry, Tina. Hold on. Okay. She's still talking. I'm She's trying to hit it off. Just give it to Andrea. She can... Sorry, it's Lisa Molina. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> My girlfriend. <laughs> so what I understand about the liquid biopsy, it's a blood biopsy, and um, they will be able to find sloughed off cancer cells. Yeah. And he, he, his, um, what, you know, to explain it, he said, it's like finding a red straw in a haystack. Not a needle in a haystack. It's more, it's like all straw and one straw is red. But does that sound right? I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a show. Yeah. It's a show. yeah. Um, it's, it, well, tumors shed, they do. Yeah. And um, that's, 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 that's really actually a great uh, conversation starter. So um, I'm not sure exactly what, which liquid biopsy study it is. I'm interested and I want to yeah, know which one it is. There are so Stanford. many. Yeah. It's Stanford. Yeah. Stanford. And I'm sure they've got more than one liquid I, biopsy I, I going on the, at Stanford. I have it in my Yeah. Pocket. I would love to see it because I'm curious because I think this is, does this pertain particularly to EGFR and it's, um, or not? I'm not sure. Yeah. That's kind of his thing, though. He's kind of a tarsy bit. Yeah, doctor. and the way you were kind of explaining it earlier, if they see the sloughing off, and as everybody may or may not know, um, the idea behind liquid biopsies, which although still aren't the gold standard, are showing huge promise in several different areas. Um, the idea being that if there's a, a, a cancerous or a, you know tumor or malignancy, it sheds off you know, cells that then get circulated in the blood, and these tests are sensitive enough to pick to pick that up. So, whether it's a, a malignancy, you know, and a diagnosis that way, or or different mutations, there's a bunch of different ways that they're using it. I'm not sure how they're trying what what they're trying to validate in this study, but I'm but, excited about it, and I'm more excited that yeah. you're participating because participating in yeah. research is huge. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. the, the 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 really great news today about blood based biopsies. They can't be used for pathology purposes. So when you're first diagnosed, they have to have the tissue to identify, not necessarily uh, your marker, yes, your markers, but what kind of cancer you have, adenocarcinoma, small cell, large cell, you know, whatever. Um, so the, the beauty of the blood-based biopsies these days are the thought process that after you've been diagnosed and you have your, you know, you, you have your follow-up and your scans and what have you, that maybe we don't need that many CT scans. Maybe we do blood tests to replace mm -hmm. the scans. And if there is, you know, some cancer visible in the blood, then we take the scan, see what's going on, and it may not even show up in the, in the lung just yet. So this would be a great way to see that things are happening, but you haven't seen it in in a CT scan yet, so you can actually start <clears throat> yeah. treatment before you see it, and that, which is it, awesome. Yeah, yeah. and that's, that's one way, um, one of the things that they're looking at, they're looking at it, you know, to see if they can pick up resistance mutations. Um, the gold standard is still, as, as you just said, the, the tissue, particularly at diagnosis, grabbing that tissue, running it through, um, you know, whether it's a comprehensive genomic profiling or, you know, a lung, a, a basic lung, lung panel to see what kind of what your cancer looks like. But then a lot of, some folks can't have tissue biopsies. It's either too dangerous or they have comorbidities or things going on like that. So the liquid biopsy is a good second option, um, even in that sort of upfront, frontline setting to potentially look and see if they can see anything. But we had a, um, um, a, a liquid biopsy uh, living room maybe three or four months ago now. So anybody who wants a deeper dive information into that, I highly recommend you go back to the video library. You don't have to do the whole two hours. It's about 30 minutes, but it takes a real deep dive look into what, where liquid biopsies are now and where they're going. And it's, it's an exciting, exciting place. Can you imagine not having to have a fine needle aspiration? Well, um, and it's... Or it's, bronchoscopy? It's absolutely the, the best 
way possible to chronically manage your cancer mm -hmm. without doing invasive um, biopsies in your lung tissue because, you know, that comes, what comes with that is the potential of collapsed lungs and, you know, stays in hospitals and all kinds of things. So, you know, we really have a lot of hope about blood-based biopsies. So that's great, Tina, for yeah, you to participate I'm, in. I feel really yeah. excited about it. And it's great it. for you as well. Yes. You know, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So Anything. we'll see. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, when, when, when we were saying a little while ago that more drugs have been approved by the FDA in the last 18 months than the last four decades, it's just amazing news. I mean, that's, and I mean, there's multiple, I, I don't even know what the amount is now. It's over 20. What, drugs? Yeah, in yeah. the last 18 months. Yeah. Um, mm. uh, uh, and the, the, the genomic markers are the things that match up the drug to those markers. So the plethora of options you have now is so much greater than it even was a year and a half ago. And a year and a half from now, it's going to be triple that. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's good nothing stuff. but good, good news. Stuff. Yeah. It's a lot of hope. A yeah. lot of hope out there. A lot of hope. A lot of hope. Hopefully you'll be able to answer some EGFR questions yeah, after we... Yeah, exactly. Tarsi, you have a question. As you know, my beautiful wife to my right, I'm Rick, by the way, is passionate about trying to support the fight against lung cancer. Yeah. And for her to be able to get into this thing, it's really cool. Because oh, yeah. She, cl clinical trials, she never qualified for a exactly. clinical trial because yeah. she never had anything to yeah. do. I mean, you know, it's yeah. like she took Tarsiva and did her yeah. chemo and radiation, and she had clean scans forever, and so she yeah. never had to worry about it. She's pretty excited. That's awesome. And so am I. Well, you know, we're really big believers in patients being part of the solution. You know, clinical research is called from the bench to the patient and back to the bench. I think that's lopsided. Explain I what the think, bench is. Okay, the bench is research, the research lab. So research lab to the patient, back to the research lab. I think that's completely upside down because it's the patient that's donating these, these specimens. You know, whenever you give blood, when you give tissue for pathology or, or whatever it is, there is no research without you. None. I think it's from the patient to the bench and back to the patient. That's transformative. And they're starting to get that. They're starting to get that. We are part of curing cancer in a big way, probably the, the major part of curing cancer. They can't do it without us, with our stuff. They need our stuff. Um, and then maybe, Rick, when we come back around, you can give a little bit of the caregiver support perspective if need be, because I know you're equally as knee-deep in this fight. She, Tina says no. That, does. Tina, does that mean he's not cooking or cleaning or vacuuming or anything? Yeah, right, exactly. Well, you know what? That's never going to happen. I mean, that's never going to happen. <laughs> that was like, like, no, he's not doing anything. <laughs> Danny. Okay, Miss Danny. Do you want to go to the back row first? Did you guys yeah. in the back row? Anybody want to? I know that's sort of a. If you don't want to talk, you don't have to. And talk. Okay. It's the safe zone. How about? Okay. Look how cute they are. My name is Bessie Chin, and I was diagnosed in April this year. And is uh, EF no EGFR <laughs> uh, non small cell can lung cancer, and right now I'm in Arisa, mm -hmm. and, oh, and uh, okay. I haven't taken the next test scan yet. Well, the biopsy, biopsy is, is negative. Negative for okay. I think I should have him talk to him for me. <laughs> right. Exactly. You saw, you saw Dr. Gandara. Um, he, uh, my son took me to see Dr. Gandara uh -huh. yeah. in UC Davis. Yep. And he said it's negative. Okay. Liquid biopsy is negative. Okay. Well, that's negative awesome. for? There's nothing in it. After the, after the ERISA. It's clean. Yeah, it's clean. Yeah, got it. That's great. And uh, right now, my biggest problem is 
my skin, my skin is so dry. I like to find out what is good for the dry skin. Okay. So okay. nearly a sun that hits me, my skin is like okay. a sandpaper. Okay. And the second thing is uh, my diet. Because I lost about 10 pounds before I discovered I had lung cancer. Okay. And the coughing, the coughing stopped. But the diet to put the food in is really hard. Okay. Uh, have you tried Ensure? Oh, all kinds. Ensure. It comes in a can and it, it has something like, I don't know, 200 protein some odd powder. Calories. Yeah. Yeah. No, no powder. It's liquid. Yes, and then you I mix have it. Ensure. And then you put in some ice cream and a banana. And it tastes really, really good. It's whipped and it's cream got on a top. lot of calories in it. Oh, okay. So Strawberries. Is it, is it a, a nausea thing, a loss of appetite thing? Uh, just lost appetite. Lost Actually, I lost appetite. my appetite for a long okay. time now. Yeah, yeah. This but guy. it's so, starting to come back now. A uh, bit. Not really. I, I no. eat, but eat very small portion. Tiny okay. little bit. That's it. So have you talked to your physician about the loss of appetite? Uh, yes, the dietitians say keep uh, taking uh, protein, protein drink, uh, yeah. all kind of yeah. protein. Have you talked yeah, to your yeah. physician about it, though? Not the dietitian, the phys your actual doctor, your medical oncologist? Uh, when I started, not now, but I did tell him that I lost 10 pounds. Yeah. I would, I would talk to him or her about it because there are um, drugs out there available that they could prescribe that could help increase the appetite. It's really important, and we say it all the time, um, that you maintain your weight. <laughs> and that the minute you feel, whether it's nausea or diarrhea or vomiting or loss of appetite, talk about shared decision making and having yeah. that conversation with your physician. It's very, very important because you don't want it to get out of control where, where the side effects become worse than the actual disease. That, we see that happen a lot. So have that conversation with your doctor. Do they normally give you medicine? They can give you medicine. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. That will help increase the appetite. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, the dry skin. If, if I so can I don't know anyone, if, what's good for dry skin? Yeah. I don't know if any of our, um, our EGFR patients have any dry skin, tar -seva, rash remedies. I know I know. Are you, uh, anecdotally, uh, when yeah. you have a mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Yes, I uh, use Cetaphil. Are yeah. you familiar with Cetaphil? Yeah, Cetaphil. Yes, I use, there's a cleanser as well as a lotion. Yeah, it's two both. different products. And so I bathe completely from my scalp all the way to my toes with the cleanser. And then I let it dry and I use the lotion on my face. And I just, I literally gob it on. So there's still streaks all over my face. And I just let it dry in over the next 20 minutes and you know, rub out whatever's left. And that really seems to help. And so, multiple times a day, not, uh, just, yes. not just in the morning. Correct. A little bit Correct. in the afternoon and So I would take a washcloth, is it mostly your face? Yeah, so I would take a washcloth with the cleanser maybe a couple times a day to wash and then follow that up with the lotion a couple times a day and especially before you go to bed. Okay. And, and the, the, way it, the way it happens with a lot of patients with the rash is the longer you're on the drug, the more your body adjusts to it, so that starts to sort of dissipate and, and go away. Okay. So Keith, that's the sort of Grass. light at the end of the tunnel. And I've had patients, yes, I've had patients say um, that aloe vera straight from the plant, not like the one you buy at the, on the shelf, but if you buy an aloe vera plant, and break it open and use the natural aloe vera, that that's very helpful okay. as well. But I want to say one more thing about your diet, and I get to do this because I'm not a doctor, but because I have been a patient, I get to, I get to give remedies. Yeah. Um, chicken noodle soup. Okay. Sounds crazy, but because, because, you know, and you wouldn't give that to a diabetic or, you know, other people because there's a lot of sodium in it and a lot of salt. But because when you're on drugs, um, regardless of what your, what your malady is, you, you um, lose your taste buds. And when you lose your taste buds, you, know, you really don't have the desire to eat 
because you can't taste anything and it's like it's like eating rubber or chewing rubber bands but chicken noodle soup has so much sodium and salt in it it you actually can taste it and it's kind of warm and feels good going down your throat and all of a sudden you're starting to feel good ronnie you, you right i'm sodium, serious sodium and spicy food i'm seems serious to be the, the you know way for most people to just go, you know you know make it taste good are there things that you enjoyed before you were you were diagnosed What's your favorite food? Oh, vegetable. Vegetables. Well, those are great, but <laughs> you're not going to gain a lot of weight eating those. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you need some carbs. Another thing, I know when I was sick, mashed potatoes in butter and salt. And garlic. Also yeah. good for gaining weight. Um, noodles and butter and salt. You know, those are all things physicians in normal circumstances are saying, oh, don't eat that, don't do that. But you need to, you need to put that 10 pounds back on. Yeah, and just as a, as a side note, to, since we're talking about the food thing, um, quite often we have patients ask us, you know, about the sugar and the diet and this, that, and the other. And we had a physician from Dana-Farber come out last year and talk, that question came up. And he was like malarkey. <laughs> he said there is absolutely zero data to prove that sugar is going to make your cancer grow any faster than it may or may not have, whether you had the milkshake or you didn't. So he's like, have the milkshake. Eat, yeah. eat, eat, yeah. drink, drink, drink. Everything in moderation. Do it. Everything in moderation, yeah. Is there anything on medical marijuana? I mean, so, I, well, that I increases your, your appetite. Munchies, so, yeah, yeah, you know, it's interesting. But, but without smoking, they have... They have edibles you know, yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah. and oils. So we get this question a lot, and in fact, we get calls from other states where medical marijuana has not been legalized. And they're like, well, can you go get some and send it to me? I'm like, I can't. I'd love to, but I can't. Um, but yeah, you could absolutely get a, um, a medical marijuana card, and you you, you don't want to smoke it. I don't I don't encourage no. smoking it. But they come in like gummy bears, and then they come in little oils where you can just put a drop of oil under your tongue or whatever. I think they she knows too much about bears. this. I don't know. I, don't I have a lot a lot of people call, and I would recommend starting with whatever half the dose they recommend is until you. And it's so here's the way medical marijuana works. So there's THC, which is the part that gets you high. And then there's CBDs, which is the medicinal part. So typically when they make the edibles, they're higher in CBDs and lower in THC. So it doesn't have the crazy making drugs so much as it does the, the medicinal part. And you know, when you're, on, when you're on therapies, when you're sick, the therapies don't do the same thing as when you're well. You know, when you're well and you, you take an opioid or you take marijuana or whatever you get, you know, these kind of crazy sidebars. But when you're ill, for some reason, it goes to reduce the illness and reduce, reduce the side effects. It just does. It doesn't make you goofy. So yeah, I, would, I would recommend talking. Right. Yeah. Exactly. 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 Uh, Katie. local physician, and I just wrote down her name because maybe she can come and speak one time, but her name's Rebecca Katz, and she wrote an unbelievable cookbook, and it's called The Cancer Fighting... She's been cookbook. here. Has she been here? Before yeah. you came, she's done yeah. Oh, I didn't room. even know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But she, yeah. she has... It yeah. reminded me, because she has she a delicious chicken noodle soup yes. recipe, yes. and it has yes. a ton of vegetables, so you might want to check Brunner it out. Rebecca drinks it all the time. Rebecca Katz, her chicken noodle soup. Yeah, yeah. Kate, come yeah. talk to Katie or I after. Yeah. So, and there's a living room segment. Um, I, I don't know. We yeah. might not have been filming at that time. She came in fairly early on, um, and she's got the Cancer Fighting Kitchen and I think a couple of others. Yeah. She's got fantastic recipes. We actually made food from the cookbook for the living room yeah. that night. Yeah, um, we did. And there's a lot of different herbs in talking about taste and what does and doesn't yeah. taste good. Um, yeah. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. And it's yeah. Rebecca K-A-T-Z. Yeah. 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 Awesome. And we'll, we'll, we'll get her back. We Remember, did. we made all the, of the food, food yeah. was from her cookbook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We spent all day, yeah. Sally, in the kitchen. But carbs, carbs, carbs. Yeah. It was you have to report back next month. We want to see you at least five pounds up. That's it. Okay. You have four weeks to gain five pounds. Okay. Challenge. Four weeks, five pounds. You can do it. I could do it in a weekend. Right. <laughs> I think I did it today. <laughs>
Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Okay. And do do either? No. Nope. Okay. Yeah, so I was, um, I am a um, 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 uh, familiar patient here in, in the living room, and thank you so much for uh, always uh, supporting me. And um, I am, in fact, I was diagnosed in two, four, four years and a half, four and a half years ago for the uh, non uh, cinema uh, stage 3A. Um, and uh, I, um, I did all the lobectomy, radiation, chemo, and uh, I, um, the doctor found out that a few months later that I still have um, a cancer cell in the lymph node, so they, they uh, gave me a, um, the genomic testing, and I was discovered with ALK. So I used the chrysotinib um, okay. for three years and a half, and it worked well. Um, uh, last week, I had a small setback that they found some spot in my brain, just very small. Um, so they, um, my my physician gave me a new drug now that is uh, supposed to cross the brain blood barrier, which is alectinib. Great. Yeah. 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 So I, my question is, um, well, first, uh, alectinib. Uh, I just used few days, but he warned me, my physician, my oncologist warned me that it will give me some muscular pain. And indeed, I, every, every day I wake up like I was be boxing the whole day, very in pain. And um, my back hurts and uh, I, I could not live. I cannot live a lot of things while with chrysotinib, it was a little bit easier. So I'm hoping that it's just because my body is just just adjusting with the new drug, and I'm just wondering if do I need to have some some guy, um, cyber knife uh, zapping um, or not? But the doctor say that maybe it's too small, so right now don't need to because alectinib is supposed to work on, in the brain. So I'm just um, I I um, well of course I was a little bit uh, disappointed with this uh, MRI, but uh, thank God we got got caught uh, soon enough. And as you said, I'm still hopeful that we have new 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 medicine coming out. And if electinib is not working, probably hopefully new stuff working because yeah. ALK is uh, somewhat, um, it's like EGFR. ALK, like with ROSE, we have a lot of medicine, I, mm -hmm. I understood. So. Yeah, there, there are several several other medications. Electinib in, in the studies and the data coming out of it showed huge effectiveness in crossing the blood-brain barrier. So that's yeah. great news. So did, did you consult, where are you being treated? Stanford. Dr. Neil. Dr. Neil is doing it. Okay. Yeah. So, did the did you talk? Did you did he have let you consult with the radiation oncologist about maybe a cyber knife or no? He's I don't no, know enough say about that it. Right now, no need to at okay. this point because it's small. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we will see what alectinib um, if it uh, takes care yeah. of it. Did it to my, yeah. Uh, or will make yeah. My and and that's great because you know we can save the other for down the road if we need it and yeah. think chronically managing. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, um, well, even though it was a bit scary, but I think that I have uh, um, three years and a half right with uh, chrysotinib and it with for a good quality of life. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful that alectinib will do the same, and uh, maybe I will buy some time, and maybe in three years and a half uh, from now they will find yeah. some more medicine. Yep. Yeah. We never know. Yeah. Um, so I'm just uh, get. Um, Try to be positive mm -hmm. and just try to manage, um, not be feeling too in pain with like running the 30k marathon every day, yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. being yeah. Uh, yeah. beaten up uh, every day. So. I would I would definitely talk to him about the the musculoskeletal pain though, and see if he has any recommendations. Again. Anytime there's a side effect, you just want to bring it to your doctor's attention as soon as possible, rather than waiting until it gets so bad that now you're, you wind up in the emergency room or something like that because because you waited too long. Just at least bring it to to hit, to Joel, Dr. Neal's attention and let him let him know. But I, I have a question. Do you drink a lot of water? Yeah, I, do you I, drink a lot of water? I do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, what do you consider a lot? A lot is like. Uh, 
Two what? Two bottles. bottles. Yeah. Okay, try four. Four? Yeah. <laughs> oh, only because, you know, I'm a big believer before you take drugs on drugs on drugs. Yeah. That, you know, you try to, you try to, to do things in a more natural way. Yeah. And very often, if we don't do enough water, we get crampy anyway. I mean, that's just kind of a side effect from not being hydrated. Yeah. So, and Danielle's absolutely right. Talk to Dr. Neil. But in the meantime, drink, drink more liquids yeah. and, and see if that, that helps in, in, yeah. in any way. Yeah. So, I'm sorry for the question. I heard someone, you maybe, um, this gentleman, saying about the immunotherapy. So, I'm just, well, of course, I, I'm, I hope. I'm hoping that um, it will work, electinib for a few more years. But immunotherapy, did you hear good things for ALK or for EGF? So, so at, um, so net, like my mom said, Dr. Um, Jonathan Reese from UC Davis, he's a medical oncologist up there. He's going to come and do Best of ASCO in July. It's July uh, 18th. Thank you, Michelle. Um, um, so you definitely don't want to miss it, even if you can't be here. It's a tune yeah. in from home and, um, and watch because he's going to give all the highlights. Yeah. But immunotherapy was yet again all the talk. But this time, um, the conversation was more around not a single agent use of immunotherapy, but combination. So combination immunotherapy with some other drug. Right. So um, and but, it's showing a ton yeah. of promise. And we highly recommend those online and those here. Come next month if you can and you're not on vacation. Go on vacation mm -hmm. if that's what you're doing. That's awesome. But so many things are happening right now that, and Jonathan will have all the answers. He's a doctor, so he can actually tell you, but a, you know. Yeah. yeah, so, and even with, um, with ALK, yeah. there are other, so Electinib is a great drug, Genentech's right down the street, um, but there are a couple of others out there as well. Yeah. yeah. So, the, the, the hope, and we talk about this all the time, is managing the disease. You know, right. we can chronically manage it and figure out what yours looks like, Next follow step. it, either with follow-up tissue biopsies or, you know, fingers crossed liquid biopsies, get there sooner rather than later to see what, you know, or how your cancer might be changing when progression comes along or something like that. And we can look at, you know, how we're going to target it. So two and a half years on prosotinib is yeah, fantastic. Yeah. In That's fact, a uh, um, few years ago, like, uh, as you said, a few years ago at my stage, probably I would have not been here talking because it's just right. like the survival yeah. would have been like yeah. two years with yeah. a and lot of suffering. Yeah, we work with yeah. a patient too, just for, you know, more hopeful sort of good news. He's 15 years on ERESA now. Oh. He's a stage four patient. He's been 15 years on ERESA. ERESA well, ERESA, ERESA Celebrex and, 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 and Maker's Mark. Oh. So he's No, that's that's so. a joke. Yeah. Well, it's not, it's a, not joke, a joke, it's true. true. But a long time ago, he was on ERESA. And um, he was also on Celebrex for a completely different thing. And he was, he was just doing so well, his doctor said, you know what, we're just going to keep you on the Celebrex yeah. as well as the Aressa because why rock the boat? Mm -hmm. And he's still doing extremely yeah. well. And, that, and Tina's, you know, on, on Tarceva for six years. I mean, all of these stories, you just never, you never know. Yeah, you, you just know. never know. So. Yeah, so yeah. thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank that's you. That's why that's why collecting data and I, I encourage all of you, we just launched a, a patient registry. I encourage all of you to get online and put your data into our registry because we will be sharing it with, with, with researchers and, and everybody. And it's a way for you to be part of the solution. But you know, I'm of the belief that we are so unique that who knows that an anti-inflammatory, along with a, a chemotherapy drug, isn't a good thing? Because, you know, in, in many ways, cancer is an inflammation. It's a cell just gone somewhat nuts. Um, and the more data we get beyond the actual therapies that are available today, that maybe there are other things we can do in combination to 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 you know keep things moving and it, into that chronic yeah, managed and that's place. A, it's a really important not that I want to get off track and talk about the registry because we've done that but it's another good reason to consider joining the registry if you haven't because the only place we're going to be able to pick up these little things and potentially maybe these commonalities is if people are reporting them somewhere right because um, it's not something that's being picked up and looked at in, right in, in masses right so.
Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yes, yeah. Flyers. Yeah, oh, then we, I, I think we have yeah, some we flyers, have flyers up there you can here. take with you when you leave, yeah. And you can see how other patients are doing on the same, with the same biomarkers and the same drugs. You know, a little graph will show up, like if you want to see how many other people are on the registry, I think we have about 400 patients there now, and we're looking at having 400,000. So you want to see how people are doing with the EGFR mutation, you, you type that in and then you, and the graph will show up. How many people have the EGFR mutation how many and people are in how long they've been on it and yeah. where they're going. So data right now to be chronically, to, to chronically manage can cancer, we need the data to do that because who knows, an anti-inflammatory because things will start to ferret out and we're gonna ask a lot of other questions, not just what cancer drugs you're on, but what other drugs are you on? You know, are you, are you, um, uh, you know, uh, do you have uh, diabetes or do you have something else going on in your body and you're on another drug? We don't know if, are those things counteracting and making the cancer drug not work as well or vice versa, maybe they're boosting but that's the information yeah. over time that's going to really tell us. Yeah. Really we pinpoint happy per to person. Show anyone who, yeah. who hasn't registered who's, who, who would like to yeah. just come chat with us after or email us if you're, if you're watching yeah. online. I want to, we, we're cut at, we're, let's keep going. Okay, let's go. Uh, my name is Dave Lynn Perez. I'm a caregiver. Um, I've coming at cancer as a caregiver, but I started as an employee. I work at Genentech. And so I feel like cancer is all around me, but now it's very personal, uh, much more than working at Genentech, which I love, by the way. Um, my boyfriend presented in 2014 with non-small cell lung cancer, stage 3B, and he went into first-line chemo and radiation, had limited success with that for about mm, six months. Then it came back, and he went to second-line chemo and just chemo, and had limited success with that, went to immunotherapy, was on that for six months, and presented with two new tumors, one eight centimeter and one five centimeter while on Optivo. And so now he's on third line chemo, which is carboplatin and Taxotere. And I just, my, I guess my question is, now he's stage four, and I, you talk about finding the right doctor, and I just feel like sometimes his doctor has not been the aggressive doctor that I felt like he needed. We've pushed for things like genomic testing, for um, just all kinds of things, and it's been like, yeah, 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 we'll get you that information. And now here we are in 2017 with his disease progressing, and things like clinical trials have never come to fruition, all these things that you know I feel are so incredibly important and at this point, um, almost, I don't want to be an alarmist, but too, too late, um, just seemed like they should have happened during these years of failed therapy, failed therapy, failed therapy. So can you just talk a little bit more about firing your doctor at stage four? Is did that you, a smart did he ever, thing to did do? Did he ever have genomic profiling? Did he have a biomarker test? You know what? I, I have not been able to go to all of his appointments because I, you know, I work. Um, but it seems as though now I have him recording his appointments and we listen to them together because in the midst of the appointment, he gets, you know, overwhelmed and, and I said, well, let's go back and listen to it together. So he always hears things differently when we listen to it together. But that was something that's just happened over the last, like maybe five appointments. So I'm not exactly sure where that has landed. If he really, really did have some genomic testing, or if it was just, yeah, 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 we'll set you up with that, and it never really happened. Yeah, so A, we need to find that out. Um, but even if they did it up front at diagnosis, at progression, they should rebiopsy yeah. and look and see what, what has caused yeah. that cancer to move, what has changed about that cancer that makes it different now, and what's the best next therapy for that. And then again, at progression, same thing. Um, so let's, talk, let's chat after you can eat, Michelle's... Yeah right next to you yeah. in the polka dots. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if you've met Michelle. Good time for a or, second opinion. Or myself. Yeah, it's a very good time. And it's not, it's, you, don't, you don't need to be an alarmist about it. It's not, it's never too late to go yeah. see somebody else. And you do not, does not mean anybody has to fire their current oncologist to go yeah. make that happen. Yeah. 
Go ahead, friend. Uh, yes, just to add to that, uh, there's an organization in San Francisco called The Second Opinion. Mm -hmm. And for free, they will take your case and review it with a tumor panel. And it's a very, rather extensive uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, look at, you know, the uh, <clears throat> biopsies uh, that have been done, uh, your case history and so forth. And, and they spend about, uh, about a half a day with you when they actually do this. I've had it done, and it's very, it's very, very useful. So it's free if you're a California resident, and it's something I would suggest. And if you want to access it, it's all one word, the second opinion. It all runs together. Great. Thanks, Fred. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Hi, John. Hi, my name is John Matthews. Um, I used to be a caregiver. My mother was diagnosed in 2011 and passed away in that year. Um, she got a chance to meet Bonnie and her family. Uh, I'm from Philadelphia, so they had a 5K out there. And our family has uh, stayed involved with raising, uh, raising money in some, uh, during their 5Ks in Philadelphia. So um, the team is called Kathleen's Crew. We raise $80,000. Um, we, uh, we do our part to, uh, in mom's memory to, to fight lung cancer. And I'm pleased to say I'm, uh, I'm part of the board here at the, the Lung Cancer Foundation. And uh, it's, uh, it's an important part of my life to do what I can to fight lung cancer for all the people who are and the families who've been diagnosed and dealing with lung cancer. But John is also doing something really magnanimous, and I don't use that word lightly. I've only used it about three or four times in my lifetime. Um, he's going to be riding a bicycle across the United States to raise awareness for lung cancer in his mom's honor. And um, you want to tell them when you're leaving and, and sure. when you plan on arriving here in San Francisco, yeah. because we can all get together and greet him when, he's, <laughs> when he rides over the Golden Gate Bridge. Yep, my family will be here with me. Um, so I leave Philadelphia August 24th. Um, it's going to take about seven weeks. It's about 34, 3,500 miles. Mm -hmm. Um, going through Pennsylvania and okay. Indiana, Illinois, a little bit of Ohio, West Virginia, Maryland. Kansas, I understand, is a little flat um, and long. Uh, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, and then out here to San Francisco. Um, so I'm taking about seven weeks off from work to do this. Um, and the purpose is for, is for the lung cancer community um, and to try to bring everyone together. Um, the uh, the name of the ride is called Ride Hard, Breathe Easy. Um, so if you go to ridehardbreatheeasy.com, you'll see a um, you'll see our a blog out there, and there's a, a website that's up through Bonnie and her team's help, uh, rhbe.org, which is where people, if you want to join and participate, um, there's there's two big elements. There's you know there's obviously the idea of me going across country with I have 40 people helping to plan this, so we can so we can raise money. Uh, the goal is to raise a million dollars. Um, and then secondly, we've targeted two dates where anybody in the world can participate. So while I'm riding across probably Utah at the time, on either September 28th or 29th, anybody in the world can do whatever you choose to to fight lung cancer. Um, and so whether you walk hard, breathe easy, or run hard, or swim hard, or work hard, or whatever it is, you do what you choose to do, and then tell us about it. You know, go to Facebook, Twitter, whatever social media you use, hit hashtag beat lung cancer, and our goal is to get everyone around the world involved. You know, our, one of our goals from the beginning was how do we make sure that anybody in the free world can, uh, can be part of this and do what, it doesn't have to be about donating money, but if we all jump in together, we can, we can bring a lot of organizations together towards this. And, not only is it Bonnie and her team helping out, but Lung Cancer Alliance has been helping out. I work at SAP, um, which is a big software company, and they're building an app, and everyone's helping towards this common purpose. And all I got to do is, yeah. I got to keep eating. So if you see me go up and eat again right, today, right. it's about third car time. Building, car building. I have to eat. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. but I'm exercising, getting ready, and I'm excited to get started on August 24th. That's great. Thank you, John. Okay. We have another, another, right here. No, Danny doesn't get to talk. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> right, right. Do we, you want to go to Joan first? Is she, Joan. Here? She's, okay, she's got her waiting mic. Waiting okay. and holding the okay. mic. Okay, okay. Hi, Joan. Okay. Hi, I'm Joan Fong. Um, 
I was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer in October 2013. I never smoked, and so it was like, oh, you gotta be kidding, really? You know, and um, didn't know about how lung cancer can affect their, anybody. And so um, that's what we're trying to advocate right now. Is her mic working? I can't hear her. It, it, it doesn't sound like really? her mic is working. Sorry, oh. Joan. Is, oh, okay. Oh, you just need to oh, there it is. There you okay. go. Now okay. I hear you. Sorry. Okay. So um, we've since learned a lot about lung cancer and have been living life very full, um, traveling, visiting friends, you know, just enjoying a great time. Um, and, and of course, family, you know, enjoying the time with our family. Um, it's been very good. I've been going through a lot of different kinds of therapy. Um, nothing lasts, seems to last more than eight months. I've had Tarsiva, um, well, I've had all, all the targeted therapies. I've had um, chemotherapy, radiation, the um, clinical trials. I've had three clinical trials, and I was trying to get into another clinical trial, and then they found out that um, the cancer had taken over half of my liver. And so I don't qualify at this point. But the advantage of um, trying to get into a clinical trial is that you, um, they give you all these tests, these scans that you have to do. And that's how I found out that I had brain mets. I had, you know, liver, liver mets. And they were able to cyber knife those things out. And so it's actually a... Uh, it's a good thing, even if you don't qualify for it, um, for the clinical trial. Um, you learn a lot about your, your body, your lung cancer. Um, and let's see what this is new. Right now I'm on, um, I just started last week on an immunotherapy, Optivo. And um, so far so good, so we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I definitely notice uh, reduced appetite and um, fatigue galore. So, yeah, just one week. And this is my husband extraordinaire. He's a wonderful caregiver and researcher. And so I'm. <laughs> I am Ron. <clears throat> I get to be the caregiver. I'm going to tell you there's fake news out there because. If you tell me that because Joan has cancer, she's not going to cook anymore, I'm going to tell you it's fake news. She never cooked. <laughs> but I can tell you that Costco makes an awesome chicken noodle soup that's really cheap. <laughs> and the chicken broth as well, but chicken noodle soup they make. That's where all those broilers that they didn't sell go, I think. <laughs> um, and, and I want to give hope to you guys that if you read anything on the internet, believe it's fake news. It really is. There's a, so much data out there, and it's so much misinformation. And the beauty of a, an event like this is that the data is true news. It's not, oh, somebody said this, and someone said this, and someone said it. There's, there's, no, there's no filter to know that the, the patient information that's out there that's being shared is real. So believe that there's no fake news here. This is the real thing. And I want to tell you, dude, don't be passive. You got to be an advocate. Um, it's good that you record those sessions because um, I read somewhere that 50% of what you hear in a patient's uh, uh, meeting with a doctor is forgotten or it misunderstood. And so you really have to have someone taking notes for you or have a recording to go over it. So it's, um, be pa don't be passive. Be an advocate for yourself and for your caregiver, I mean, for your, um, for your spouse, and um, just be proactive. I learned a lot about lung cancer for some reason now. Um, and so... And one is not passive. No. <laughs> I have questions now and then, yeah. And so don't lose hope. You really do need it. This is a wake-up call to get it together. We have a, um, a caring bridge, and we talk about um, living the life compressed, and that's what you need to do to realize that Eventually, we're all going to die. Cancer or no cancer, eventually we're all going to kick the bucket. 
the question is now we have a little alarm bell saying it's happening sooner than you thought, so get your act together, get all that legal stuff, get all that emotional stuff, get that spiritual stuff taken care of so that you know what's going to happen, um, that you have uh, a legacy that you can be proud of. And have fun. And have fun. Have and we've fun. done a lot of fun in the last 44 months. Yeah. Um, we're trying to make it to 60 months. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she turned 60 in November, so that's two 60s and beyond that we're trying to shoot for. <laughs> And, um, and we're with Kaiser. We have now had 14 different lines of therapy um, in trying to attack this, and we'll just keep kicking the can down the road. Um, we heard the big P word the other day from the oncologist about, um, is that the P word? Chemo brain affects me as well as her, I think. <laughs> um, palliative care, that was the P word. Palliative palliative care and we said holy cow palliative care that sounds like hospice but if you go it's not hospice but it's the thing that we were saying was that from the very get-go even though we want to make this a chronic management disease there's not a lot of stuff sometimes out there and so um, palliative care is not a bad thing palliative care means you're going to live a good quality of life for as long as you can. Yeah. And that's what we're, our goal is, is to live a good quality of life, yep. cancer or no cancer. And we're happy to be here and be part of it. Yep. Thanks, Ron. So a couple of things um, that you said that resonated with me, I want to make sure that we clarify. Number one, palliative care to, to the Fong's point, because I'm sure Joan echoed your sentiment about when you heard it, panic sort, sort of starts to set in because you automatically think of hospice. And we've actually had living rooms about this too. And they need to call it something else, and we here to tend to call it supportive care because that's exactly what it is. So when we're talking about managing side effects and whether it's nausea or loss of appetite or the rash or any of that, talk to your physician about it right away um, because supportive care and palliative care go hand in hand. They're yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Let's manage our side effects. Let's ensure that your quality of life is, is maintaining a level at which there is quality, right? Because otherwise, why are we doing this? So, so number one. And then number two, I want to commend um, Ron for constantly keeping us updated because it really helps when he does come back with the question about what is next or what do you think about this or I saw that for me to have this sheet where I can go back and see Joan's whole history. Like, this is where she started. This is her first line. This is what she was on. This is when she progressed. This is what happened. And it's just this timeline view, real quick Snapchat or snapshot of, of everything. So I give you huge, huge, huge kudos for doing that. And I, you didn't email me back yesterday, so we'll talk after the living room. <laughs> OK, sorry, I'm done. Fred, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, uh, Kaiser does have specialists in palliative care, yeah. and they also have social workers. Yeah. So, I, uh, yeah. and usually the social worker yeah. and the palliative care, a physician, yeah. and they are yeah. they are physicians. Yeah. They work hand in hand. Yeah. And this is just if you're having trouble with chemotherapy or something like that, you're getting you know you're getting uh, you're dealing with side effects. Mm -hmm. The other thing I, I like to mention, and Ron, uh, you know, stressed this point: when you're doing research on the internet, make sure you look at the date yeah. of the entry. Yeah. You know, when you see something that is dated 1995, you might want to, you know, do a little follow-up research. And it might be the third thing that comes up on page one. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So you yeah. have to be real careful about yeah. that. Yeah. And, you know, one other thing, too, to everyone's points here, um, it's not the institution. Sometimes people have a mindset. It's, it's harder to unlearn people than it is to teach them. You know, they'll think, well, you know, I, I, you know, I've been diagnosed with whatever. I have to go to MD Anderson. And there are some amazing people in MD Anderson, but there's some not so amazing. So it's not the building. Make sure you're with the right person. Truth. Every institution has good physicians. And it's your job to find the right ones. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Ready. We're all staring. Okay. New people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm I'm Kurt. I'm gonna start. This is my wife Susan. On uh, May second, she went to the doctor uh, having trouble breathing, and and she's an athlete, and so this was 
uh, kind of unexpected, had been about three weeks and within, uh, went to uh, basically a lung doctor after the um, initial uh, um, suggestion of our, um, her internist and then uh, in two days, if I remember correctly, went to an oncologist. And so it's lung biopsy, yeah. So you're gonna you're gonna join in here. <laughs> um, so we've been involved in this for six weeks, and so uh, being here with all of your comments are 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 really really helpful because the the first meeting with oncologists was not very positive. It really wasn't, and and after that um, we. We spent some, uh, the second meeting with the oncologist, she became extremely positive in terms of support. Um, and uh, Susan's um, cousin, uh, Vicki, uh, uh, told us about Bonnie. And uh, about two weeks into our, our, our journey here, uh, Bonnie called us on Saturday morning at about eight, uh, about eight o'clock in the morning and we were driving up to work. We work on a farm. She works on a farm six days a week. And uh, so we got, we got a lot of hope from, from Bonnie. Mm -hmm. And then uh, have since uh, talked with um, Danielle and Michelle and everybody. And um, uh, Susan has, uh, 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 not quite a week ago, uh, she had her second uh, chemo session. Um, she's had a uh, biopsy, a lung biopsy. Basically, basically her cancer was uh, discovered in the lungs, and there's still no origin after a whole series of tests. Um, and so, uh, it's the chemotherapy is to take care of the lung cancer and and pro and where it has spread. And uh, she uh, has also, uh, there were a couple little things in, in, um, in her brain, and she's had CyberKnife with Dr. Wara, with Kaiser at the um, Kaiser Center in San mm -hmm. Bruno, uh, South San Francisco. You're going to correct me on all of this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so uh, she's had, what, three CT scans, if I remember correctly? Uh, Yeah. Do you want to? Uh, three CTs, one PET, and two MRIs. Um, they needed that for the cyber knife. So, um, because it's unknown origin, um, there and it's a the KRAS mutation. There isn't any. Um, there aren't any. Uh, We've done lots of molecular testing on the biopsy, and everything comes up negative to all the the, the things, the amniotherapy, the um, um, the uh, markers. None of that, none of that's going to work at this point. So I just have to stay alive long enough till they find it, or they find, or we have more molecular testing that's more definitive. Did they? I have a question on the, on the molecular tests. Maybe Michelle or Danielle can help. What did they look for? Did they just do a small little test, or did so, they do it? So, so let's so, comprehensive so Susan, test. when we talked last week, um, I was in Albuquerque at a meeting that was right, um, and it was wonderful to be able to step outside and talk to you for an hour. <laughs> um, one of the challenges is that um, there are multi bilateral lesions that are this big. So getting good quality tissue is a problem, which is why... Blood. Well, so this is why we're seeing Gandara next week. Um, um, but which is why the diagnosis is really a malignancy of unknown origin, because they can't definitively say it's stemming from the lungs, right? It's acting like it. Looks like it. Um, it, it, um, it yeah, looks it like it. Like a like duck. It. it quacks like a duck. Yeah. But we don't yeah. know if it's a duck. Correct. Yeah. And so yeah. when I had talked, I had reached out to Dr. Gandera last week, and there was some concern because of the unknown origin about whether or not he could get in. And I was like, in ground, he's glass. getting in. Yeah. yeah. So. I yeah. 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 So it's happening next week, which is 
the best news possible, and yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I, I know we talked about your doc um, at, at Kaiser and uh, his or her willingness. Yeah. I can't remember the name. She's your head is being good. Yeah, yeah. she to, really to looked me. Yeah, yeah, and I said I yeah. want everything. Yeah, okay. and so the. Um, Carboplatin and Taxol. Taxol. Mm -hmm. She put the big, she threw the big stuff at yeah. me. Yeah. And that was um, her regimen. Yeah. That, and I just choice. said, you just, yeah. you, I yeah. don't care. Because one of them I could yeah. have that I wouldn't lose my hair. I'm like, I don't, yeah. Yeah. I don't care about my hair. We had a we had a head shaving party at our yeah. at, in, up yeah. in Tahoe. Yeah, yeah. I sort of like having point. just a little bit that everyone thinks yeah. maybe she really does have hair. Right. No, but this is going to yeah. be gone yeah. in a week, so yeah. it's gone. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I. It's. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how, how how little we think about the things that, when we're well. We spend right. so much time on. Right. Like, huh, who cares? Shave it off. No, I don't care. care. But, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was hard when it was all falling out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is hard. And he yeah. hearing that every single test was negative, that yeah. there was nothing besides chem chemotherapy, yeah. and I'm like, okay, be positive, Susan. Right. Uh, let's see here. You know, and I lost yeah. it. But I think one of the things, and, and I think we talked about this, and Mom, you can you can talk about this too, because back in, she was diagnosed in 2003, she had surgery in 2004, but at that time, nobody was doing genetic testing on anything. Right. We had no right. idea what she yeah. had or didn't have or what it meant or, I mean, there was nothing. It was, you will have chemotherapy and radiation. In the first place was, maybe we'll get you six months. Right? I mean, that's what we heard. So you have to sort of... You want, not, not that you don't want to listen to your doctor, but it's why I told you it's so important that you're with a specialist, somebody yeah. who this is all yeah. that they yeah. do. They yeah. can really take a deep yeah. dive look. We talked about the comprehensive genomic profiling and the liquid biopsies if they can't get good quality tissue, all of yeah. that kind of stuff. And David Gandera will do all of it. And especially, especially when they don't know what the primary is. Mm -hmm. Because if it turns out that the primary isn't long, he will get you to the right, mm -hmm. the right people. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. But you feel better. Yeah. So you're responding yeah. to the chemotherapy. Yeah, my only yeah. symptom was shortness of breath. Yeah. Okay. I mean, last um, November we hiked Patagonia and we did 18 miles a day. Yeah. And okay. I mean, yeah. this yeah. is like crazy. It, it just, yeah. you know, comes yeah. out of the blue that yeah. you have stage four lung cancer and it's yeah. and metastasized and you're I'm thoracic happy. and I'm you're like, what the hell? I'm exercising. I'm doing all this stuff. How is and I don't, problem? yeah, I've lost, I, yeah. that's the problem. I, I do need to talk to my doctor because all of the anti nausea drugs don't work. So I have to I have to deal with figuring that out. So have they probably Zofran? gave you Zofran. So Make a company it. called Tesaro just got approval for a new anti nausea drug, okay. and I will grab it and give it to you afterwards to talk to your doctor. Okay, because I'm on another one too. That's only that's that can cause psychotic episodes. That um, I'm also on during that time. Okay. Okay. But that didn't work either. So not okay. nothing worked. Neither did um, okay. cannabis. So nothing. Okay. So is it? Is it? How soon does it hit after chemo, and how long does it last? Um, it the I feel like a million bucks because I'm on Dex, because I'm on a steroid. Yeah. So the next day I feel great, and my breathing really is improved. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the next day, I can't move. So part of the problem, too, with the breathing could potentially be the anxiety, the not feeling well, increases your heart rate, makes your, you know, sure. your breathing and your blood pressure and all of that stuff accelerate. So but I would just definitely I talk feel, to... I feel, I mean, I'm so nauseous I can't eat. So I've lost seven pounds mm -hmm. in this process, and I don't need to, I don't want to lose any weight. Yeah. So, and but I, are, I'm hungry. I ate tonight. Good. Okay. Well, yeah. you know. <laughs> okay. you, good. You, and you are on steroids? Yes. No, I'm no. not. On, that was that's one of the things I'm going to talk to my doctor okay, about. Because I, uh, I just I went on steroids. I wanted to eat the living room. I'm not kidding. She did. It was ridiculous. I went from one extreme to completely the other. So. But it matters. My head's an got important twice time. The size. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So steroids will. Yeah, that was yeah. the thing I was going to okay. talk to her about because yeah. it. I, I feel like, yeah, I feel yeah. like superwoman okay. on those things. Yeah. And prior yeah. to, to the steroids, okay. when they finally put yeah. her on it, my sister and my brother yeah. and my stepdad and I were literally trying to force feed her. Yeah. Like, what else? We're making 12 different meals, like, at, at one thing, yeah. trying to, like, maybe this will work. Come yeah. on, Mom, try this. Yeah. She would be like, get out and of my they're face. Doing, the they're doing said, the same thing. I said to my family, I said, you know, I think I actually look better now than I did when oh, I had good. cancer. Nice. And it was because my face was the size of a bowling ball, <laughs> and I didn't have one wrinkle. 
Oh, yeah, on the steroids. Would, yeah, yeah, my face was just like so fat. There were no wrinkles. And they were going, yeah, yeah, Mom, you look great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. So, let's, yeah. Yeah. Let's see what happens with those. I, and, and one comment I think Ron said and a couple of others that when this first happened, you know, you go online because it's all available to us. And the amount of information that there that is conflicting yeah. and and it, it's so hard to find your way through it. And that's the reason this organization is just... Stay off the internet. Call yeah. us. Yeah, I, and I told Susan she's got our contact information. I'll yeah. open it to all of you guys. If you ever have questions, just reach out. If we don't get back to you, like, within 30 seconds, we will as soon as we can. Um, but absolutely, reach out to all of us. That's what we're here for. Yeah. You don't have to. These um, are these are two boys, Preston and Forrest. Yeah. yeah. Preston's in from the East Coast to see Aww. mom. So. Nice. nice. Bonnie, They're if I wonderful. Could, if I can just add on the, on your sons here, this is wonderful to see you guys. Yeah. Um, you remind me of, of my two sons. We're about the same age, and my sons are about the same age, and one is out of town, one lives locally in the Bay Area. You guys are huge as far as this goes. So what you do, what you support, what, what everything you're doing is hugely important. Your constant communication with your folks, um, I can't stress it enough. Like you, I'm, you know, mine was in March of this year, so I'm, you know, the, the bowling ball is still somewhere on my head, you know, bouncing off of there. So it's happening to all of you as it was and is for, for my, yeah. uh, my wife and two sons. Yeah. So it does get a little easier, you know, even, even though we don't know where it's all going. Um, but at the same time, you know, the four of you, and if you have partners, girlfriends, whatever, wives, um, you know, if, if they get involved as well, all of that love, you can never be surrounded by too much love. So. Right. Th thank you so much for saying that. And obviously it's not mandatory, but anybody who would like to connect outside of the you know, monthly living room, please feel free to talk to one another after the meeting um, and do that. Because I think that's very sage sound <coughs> advice, especially coming from a patient, right? Who, you, like you said, you're still new to this game and, and being able to, to send that across. And it is important that the whole family is involved. And, you know, we've often talked about Hard. having a living room just for the family members. Yeah. Because when someone in the family has cancer, everybody has cancer. Mm -hmm. It, it just is that way. And a place for the, the, your children and your relatives and your wives and husbands to just come and talk about, you know, what's happening. And we really encourage honesty across the, across the spears in families because you're all worried about the same things, but you're not talking about it. But you're all, you're all thinking exactly the same thing. And it's important to talk about it. It really is because once you do, you got, you're got like, okay, we got that out of the way. Now let's go fight. Does that make sense? It's, it's huge. True. There are no secrets. Everybody's it's keeping true. secrets, but there aren't any. You're it's all true. thinking the same things. Very true. Yeah, you know, it's so true, Bonnie. My most difficult conversations are with my father yeah. and my sons. Yeah. And you look those people yeah. in the eye and yeah. you talk about this and yeah. it's just so heavy. Yes. So you've got yes. to get past that. You've got to get over that. You've got yes. to continue talking yes. and get comfortable with, with your new reality yes. exactly. as much as you possibly can. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. it is freeing. It's, but it, it's, you've got to get over that hump. Yeah. It's, it's because just so you, you, your kids are worried they're going to remind you that there's something that you haven't thought about. But they have thought about it. And the same thing with you and your children. They're thinking about it. So you need to put it out on the table. And once you put it out on the table, it's easy to be a family again. And actually laugh a little bit, share a meal, have a beer, watch a, watch a, watch a Warriors game. Um, you know, whatever that is. You know, get it out and get back to the family mode you were in before cancer. And go from there. Audrey, I just want to see if anybody online has anything they want to share um, from Andrea or Michelle. Michelle's going to give some updates. Okay. And for those of you who haven't met Michelle, I think most of you know Michelle. 
Just say who you are before you talk online. So I'm Michelle, patient services. I think I know almost everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you all know that I also came to the foundation when my mom had lung cancer and my mother-in-law got diagnosed shortly after my mom. And so being a caregiver, being in the system and not getting any support, when I found out this was here, I came to volunteer. And I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, it's almost four years ago. I'm not leaving. <laughs> um, so really quick, Karen Gorenberg in Florida is online. And um, she was diagnosed in 06 with stage 4 on Tarceva since 07. 10 years. Um, she had her six-month scans, and everything's still stable. So good news. Hi, Karen. Hi, Karen. Karen was here la last month or the month before. She was she live, was, live was and in person here in the living room. Yeah. Florida. Yeah. And then we have someone new, uh, Mary, Marianne in Arizona. She's stage three, non-small cell. Just had her first chemo and was happy to be here online. So, oh. And then several, tons of people online. Okay. Fantastic. Hi. So, so anybody welcome. who's online who hasn't already connected um, with Michelle or... Bonnie or I, please, you know, outside of the living room, please do. We'd love to hear your stories and help to uh, navigate you through the process. Is that it? I just had one you. comment. Um, Danny's I'm back. Here. I know. We're so, so excited. Um, I met Hurricane Bonnie 13 years ago. Um, I was uh, working for Sequoia Hospital where she received her care and, and her diagnosis. And um, uh, she's literally telling the truth when she's saying that she took the bull by the horn because my job was to go mop up after her and go pet the doctors and their <laughs> egos because she decided what was going to happen and they were all going to fall in line. I'd say, I know she's just a forceful lady. You know, you know, I would come in behind and just go, it's okay. She knows what she's talking about. It's her. And now it's such a different paradigm, which is so great because physicians today are so much more open about patients getting involved in their care and their journey and their destiny that it's much more of a normal conversation was before we had to go behind and mop up her, um, you know, mop up her mess and, and, you know, killing their egos. But I will say what I, what I learned in being part of the care team um, with Bonnie is it's okay to have cancer-free days. And the girls used to call me and say, Danny, get mom out of the office. Get mom out of the house. She's got to go shopping. She's got to do something. So I'd get on that phone, pick her up, and we'd go drinking, shopping, doing anything we can. We'd wake up in a hotel room, <laughs> literally not realizing where we are. And I was the one that, I mean, there was nothing left on the table that we couldn't talk about. We talked about maxing out our credit cards. And I said, what do you care? You're not supposed to be alive next year. Um, you're not going to, you know, <laughs> I, I know put, that's I, okay. let's put everything on your car. It's okay to say yeah. things like that. That's okay. If we can't, if we can't say any, drive any point home, there has to be humor. I remember one night, we, you know, we were having a Sunday dinner and all the kids were there and the grandkids and whatever, and I'm cooking. And, and then I'm doing the dishes and I'm looking at all of my people, you know, laying and relaxing and and so I turned the light switch on and off on and off on and off and they go what what's that what's that I said excuse me I have cancer should I be doing the dishes and they all went oh maybe probably not so they all scurried up and did the dishes and I left and then we I very the quickly dishes. got over you trying to pull the cancer right, card right, all the right. time well my favorite is we tried to get into this restaurant in San Francisco and we couldn't get in and I go well, just, don't you have to go to the bathroom? And so she goes to the bathroom, and I said, God, she's got lung cancer. <laughs> and I said, I mean, I don't know if we're going to be able to eat here again. I mean, and the problem was she looked so good. So it was kind of like, you know, it's just, it's, it's a real, you know, we not, might not be back. Well, anyway, we ended up going back to this restaurant like six times. And so we kept not believing. They stopped again. serving. Like, she's supposed to be like, dying. You're dying. Yeah, you're dying. And I said, well... It's, yeah. it's a good thing. Your food is a miracle. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, we it, that that was the that was our laughter, thing. Laughter, laughter right? is. is um, you laugh. have to find those moments. Yeah, you have. You, have you to absolutely find those have to moments. find the moments. We yeah. used to call your you, we, getting the pulled over by the police. Right. And right. right. Yeah. All yeah. you know. Yeah. 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 You have Thanks, to, one of your doctors um, sticking right. his head out the right. um, wi uh, the sunroof sunroof on the wine tour. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think it's important that what Danny just said because we 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 say this all the time. Although I don't think we've said it recently, and so I appreciate you bringing it up, Danny. That you're gonna have bad days, right? And I and I don't say this from 
the perspective of a, of a patient, but, but I do a caregiver and what I witnessed. And everybody's allowed to have those bad days. Just don't live in them because keeping your head in the game is half the battle in this space. I mean, it really, really, really is. Yeah. And Susan, you and I talked about this, about patients that I've worked with that got diagnosis and they just decided they were getting in bed and that was it. They weren't yeah. getting back out again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that does not bode not well for anybody. Yeah. Not an option. Yeah. So thank you for... For, for bringing that back up. Um, we are out of time, so I want to go ahead and do my thank yous. Of course, everybody's welcome to stay um, and grab some food and some dessert that the lovely Sally or take um, food. is so yeah, kind take um, to bring to us. But I, but I, um, um, as we talked about, our, our next living room is Dr. Reese, uh, Jonathan Reese from UC Davis, Best of Asco, and that's on July 18th. Um, uh, I want to, Katie, do you want to, is there something you want to say real quick about events? Next up, San Francisco 5K, anything? Uh, no? Just to ask, if anybody's interested in events, come talk to me afterwards, and I'll give you a calendar of the upcoming ones. Yeah, great. Thank, thanks, Katie. Um, a huge thank you to the um, to our partners and, and support group who, without their um, gracious support, we wouldn't be allowed um, or able to bring this to you. Um, Astellas, Bristol Myers Squibb, Celgene, Genentech, Lily Merck, Novartis, and the Yahoo uh, Employee Foundation all help to support um, uh, this program so that we can post it live here in the room and not only do that, but be able to live stream it out around the world and then provide, you know, the, the um, I almost called it a leftover because right. you said it, um, right. the edited versions right. in, our right. in, in our living room. Um, it's so, so, so important and I think you touched on it earlier. We've had just under a million impressions in 143 different countries when it comes to this to this meeting. So there's a huge, huge need out there for this type of information, education, and support in the lung cancer community. Um, it's available online for those of you who don't know, um, um, uh, subtitled in Spanish and Chinese as well. So um, we're hitting, uh, you know, a, a, a fairly large population and, and really helping to make that mark. I don't know what you're saying, Sam. I want to thank the office bar and grill, but grab a mic. The office bar and grill um, for providing the food. Peninsula Television, of course, for coming in here and tirelessly um, lugging in all of this equipment and then tearing it all down afterwards. Thank you so much for all you do um, the, and, and for airing it. Take a pic in that room before you go oh. and see what they bring in here yeah. once a month. I mean, they bring in the entire studio to yeah. make this happen. Yeah. And all we give them is mac and cheese. <laughs> It's not all we give they them. They got all, sliders. They eat it all in sliders. They got sliders. sliders. Um, um, and then they air it on the local cable yeah. channel all month long. So yeah. we've, we've, we've been out to dinner before. This one and I are maybe sitting yeah. at a bar yeah. in Half Moon Bay. And um, people, some lady comes up in our shoulders. She's like, oh, my God, you guys are the cancer ladies. I watch you the on TV all the time. cancer ladies on Channel 26. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, us. That's us. Um, yeah. Staff, everybody in the room, and everybody who was not able to be here tonight, we have... Um, as Katie kind of pointed out, a, a small but mighty team of individuals who are, pardon the French, but kicking ass and taking names. We're really out there working hard 24-7 for you guys. Um, and all of those diagnosed before you and those that will be diagnosed after you to really try to, to change what this, what this disease looks like. Um, so I can't thank our ALCF and Alchemy staff enough. Yeah. And then the most important thank you out, obviously goes out to the patients. Um, and, the, and your support teams and your caregivers um, and everything that you do to help support this foundation uh, in, up to and including sharing this night with, um, with the cameras and everybody who might be um, chiming in and, or tuning in. I can't, 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 can't thank you enough. This, the input you provide is so incredibly valuable and important. Um, in ensuring that we move this needle forward. So, big round of applause. Oh, do you right. want to say one more thing? One, before we do the applause, uh, you know, one thing, for, especially for all the new people that don't know, we're more than this. We're much more than this. This is our favorite thing to do, and patients are always first. But our second foundation is all about research. We're doing our own research. We're doing our own blood-based biopsy trial. We're doing, um, uh, hopefully, a, a phase three trial for small cell. Uh, lung cancer with uh, combination uh, immunotherapy. We're doing so many things um, that we're so very proud of that have never been done before. You come in here and it looks like oh, this great comfortable living room, which it is, yes, but we are, we are, we are doing some things that no one else is doing yep. and so proud. Yep. 
We're happy to talk yeah. to anybody who wants to talk about it. Yeah. Did you need something to happen? I don't know what's happening. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Good night online in the room. Thank you. Sorry. Huh. I know I told you. Thank you.